Hello, welcome to the Cube Pod, episode sixty-three. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante for our podcast Back Friday. We we missed last week. Dave, good to see you. Hey, John. Um, we were both traveling around both of events. I was on the East Coast uh, for Click and also for AWS in New York City for their Financial Services Symposium. You were at Snowflake at Moscone you were in, my, in my neck of the woods. I then came back and did Databricks this week. So uh, yeah, we had a little bit of a we had to run reruns and some of the highlights from your show and. And click so uh we're back back in the saddle here you know we try not to miss a game it's like you know it's like the lou gehrig streak we want to go podcast and keep them going but it's you know, just sometimes we just you know it's just not going to work with all the events happening it's just pretty pretty insane um but we're back like in the past two weeks dave like the, the two big data shows went on um head to head not this week not the same week but back to back weeks it was almost like you know, uh, it's like it's like the home game. The, the visiting team goes up first at Snowflake, and then Databricks gets last licks at the plate. They get the second event, and then in between, it's just the, the, the constant comparisons between the two companies. Um, and then Apple had their big um, generative AI news as part of their worldwide developer uh, forum that they do, developer conference, and um, a lot of good stuff there. I actually like their AI. We're gonna get into that, and then obviously. There's tons to talk about between the comparison between Snowflake and Databricks. Um, I haven't, I didn't get a chance to have one on one with Ali Godsey. I did text him on the weekend before. I know Rob, uh, uh, Rob on our team did. You met with the CEO of Snowflake, so I want to get into that. And then just there's um, now kind of reports kind of coming around from the Cube Pod months ago. We we talked about remember a year ago, small language models and the power law. That was the headline at Databricks, and also in some of the analyst blogs. You're starting to see people talking about what we were talking about a few months ago, which is, you know, it felt like a weird environment. But we were talking about how it kind of was weird and like it, it feels like a bubble, but it's like it may not be as good of an environment um, uh, on earnings and and just the market. But the earnings are good. But you're starting to see budgets, and I want to we want to I want to deep dive with you on this around the bifurcation of budgets. Um, so there's a there's that's emerging, and it's starting to see signals where people are talking about it. You know what's going to be. The, where's the where's the hype on generative AI converting over into um, reality? And so, ton to talk about. Um, but but first of all, let, let's get into the to the to the big conversation that you and I both had this past week and two weeks is Snowflake versus Databricks, two big events. You can really see those companies still at it competitively, but they're kind of going to the same place. Dave, open formats. They're trying to maintain their lead and their moat. Um, different company makeups. One's you know very business oriented, like Snowflake, and the other one's more developer, open source. Uh, interesting comparison. And um, you know, you were on the ground at Snowflake. I was at Databricks with the, with our team, uh, Rob and team. But Databricks dropping the number two point four billion in run rate. Okay, um, that's interesting. Now compare that to say OpenAI is doing three point four billion, but that's a different company. Pretty significant to drop that revenue number as a private company. And well, Snowflake. Well, you know what are they doing for revenue? So you're starting to see them, you know, <laughs> squint through the squint through the the data. It's like kind of they're kind of going to the same place. Yes, um, with different, completely different philosophies. And and as we pointed out before, I mean, there's no question that Databricks is growing substantially faster than. Uh, than than Snowflake, we see that in the ETR data, and we've been reporting that for well over a year now. Um, the the other thing is we pointed this out as well that that Snowflake bundles in AWS revenue and you know passes that on. You know it's 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 part of their revenue number. Whereas Databricks is a, is is a cleaner Databricks number. In other words, it doesn't include um, the the revenue from AWS and other cloud pl players, that's going to change, I guess, with serverless. But, um, but the point is that if you took away the Snowflake revenue that comes from AWS, they'd probably be a lot closer in size. And Databricks is growing faster, so that's kind of interesting. And I think the other piece of that is that the question that it lends is that bundled pricing model interfering with its goal of having all data this is snowflake all data all workloads because as we've again been reporting you know snowflake customers tell us they're doing data engineering work outside of snowflake because it's too expensive to do it inside of snowflake snowflake of course bristles at that i've talked to sridhar he said no no we're cheaper 
We have the data to prove it. Um, Databricks has published uh, TCO data that says just the opposite um, and has made apples to apples comparison or what they say is apples to apples comparison. I don't doubt it. I just haven't done the homework. Um, and I'm sure it's, it's valid because they get good discounts as well from, from AWS. The ironic thing here, John, is I think Snowflake and Databricks are probably two of the biggest ecosystem partners of AWS and are probably driving, like, I know they're driving like a ton of revenue. So they're both getting good discounts. You can dig into the Snowflake 10K and see how they renegotiate. Yeah, I mean, I, I find that interesting. I wanted to explain that. I want you to explain that because I think, you know, we, you, you, you and I were talking over the weekend. I worked all weekend preparing for Databricks. I think you took some time off. I'm going to take some time off this weekend too, but um, you didn't get back to um, my text on Monday. And remember we were talking about it and, and there's a, there's a nuance to what you're talking about here. You're talking about a public company, Snowflake, and you're talking about margins. It's a financial thing. It's not a product comparison. Okay. So like what happened, what I learned at Databricks this week was, is that they're very product focused and, and in that business, it's a TCO calculation and everything's included AWS costs. So, so, so I want you to explain specifically about this AWS cost piece and how it relates to the snowflake margins. Um, and then how Databricks handles it, because there's a nuance. It's not just, it's there are two things going on here. There's the product TCO total cost of ownership between the two companies. And then there's also the financial margins of the companies from a financial reporting standpoint. That's so correct. Explain specific, because this is really, really important because it, it really lifts the skirt up on the numbers. Because if you bundle the costs into the price, that's not your costs. You can't really control that. I mean, you can control through discounting and volume buying, but like explain, I want you to take a minute to explain the Snowflake bundled Amazon costs and Databricks because Databricks does include AWS costs. So I talked to Ali Godsey about this in the TCO calculation. Yeah, and it's TCO model. So there's two different things. One is and Databricks is not a public company, so it's a little harder to um, you know get to their data. But Snowflake's a public company. Like you said, it's easy to pull up the skirt. So you basically have Snowflake sells software, their database software, their data cloud. And they charge for that. But they also, as part of that, they charge you for AWS compute and storage. And that's all bundled in there. Um, and so, and they mark that up. They get a discount from AWS. They they buy massive amounts, billions of dollars. They commit to these like long-term five, 10-year deals with AWS and other cloud su suppliers. So they get a discount. It's like buying reserved in instances like times a thousand. And and they mark that up. Now they we've talked to Snowflake about this. They said, well, we don't mark it up that much. Um, okay, it's just it's it's you always use that term shifting the deck chairs in the Titanic. It doesn't really matter where you're marking it up. You're marking it up somewhere. So yeah. the point is, if if the CFO of Snowflake, Mike Scarpelli, cuts the the cost too much of the markup and starts giving away AWS cost at cost, that affects their gross margin. And they're, you know, they got to have gross margins. They're a software company. So they got to show gross margins north of 70%. So they're in this really tough spot right now, in our view, because of we have talked to so many customers who said, no, it's too expensive to do the data engineering and the data pipelining and the data science work inside of Snowflake. That's why we do it elsewhere. And that's why I think you have so many accounts that have overlap. They have both Snowflake and Databricks because ostensibly, Customers are telling us it's it's less expensive. Now, I will tell you, I talked to a number of customers at Snowflake Summit that said, no, that's not true. And I think what they mean is, well, it's all there. It's everything's convenient and it's easy for us. But I, again, I have to, I've always said, I haven't done the homework. Call me lazy, but I haven't done the homework. And I will, I promise I'll dig in. I have, I have data from Snowflake. I have data from Databricks and I'm going to evaluate it. Stretch A and I are going to dig in and do our own independent analysis. I have to say, John, it, anecdotally, just we've talked to in, enough customers that I do feel like Snowflake has a a pricing and a packaging problem uh, that they got to address. I, I think it's 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 well, it's legitimate concern that I've talked to Wall Street analysts about it, and I don't think they're really tuned into it. Um, but I think the customers are. Well, I think I think what or social this is confusing because what they think we're saying is is that and it's a bad they think it's a bad thing is that that we're saying that Databricks doesn't include AWS cost. Well, 
now that they have 100% serverless, they absolutely do. So that's clear. So that is need that needs to be on the record. That is true. Databricks has to include serverless costs because it's serverless. On their benchmarking, that's where uh, Ali was pointing out that um, they always include the costs. Yeah, of course. Okay, they don't, they because do. you have to include the cost. But the question that you're bringing up is, do they mark it up in the in those cases? They could do spot instances that you said they can do all kinds of things like you know, to reduce that cost. But but I think that's the nuance. And I, so I, what, I'm, I'm pretty sure, well, again, I'll validate that. I'm pretty sure that Databricks is not marking up the AWS costs, certainly to the extent that Snowflake is. Um, now, again, Snowflake says we're not marketing up that much. So essentially, they're saying we're marking it up. <laughs> so they're admitting that. But so again, it's a matter of where you put it. So I think, I think this is. I don't think this issue is going to go away. And Snowflake has said we want to be, you know, everything to everybody. Um, and and I, it's very clear they're they're getting beat in certain workloads. Having said that, the latest ETR data shows them pretty prominent in machine learning, and they've never shown up in the machine learning sector. But they just did this past quarter. The current survey that's in the field, they don't very clearly don't have the momentum that's that Databricks has. The the, the, the Databricks momentum is off the chart. Snowflake has decent momentum, very good momentum, and actually has a, more customers. Um, but as you said, Snow Databricks is growing faster than Snowflake. This we know, but this is a problem that's not going to go away. And you know, we're yeah. frankly going to keep reporting on it. Yeah, of course, we're definitely going to keep it going. And, and and by the way, you know, as Databricks pointed out there at their event, um, eight 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 out of the Snowflake's ten biggest customers have migrated chunks of their workloads to, to Databricks. So there's a, that's a great indicator. And by the way, a lot of people are migrating off their stuff. Like for example, what was the stat again? What was the stat again? Eight out of ten. Eight out of Snowflake's biggest ten customers have migrated to Databricks over the past two years. Not all their workloads, chunks, according to Databricks. The data science and the data engineering stuff. It, it, we've talked to so many yeah. customers that said it's just too expensive to do inside of Snowflake. Again, we've talked to yeah. customers, no, no, that's not true. Well, I, that's true. Well, enough no. customers that we can confirm that, that that's, a, that's a trend. We first reported this at Snowflake Summit in 2023, when we first sort of caught wind of it. Look at Snowflake, it's a great business. Yeah, but yeah. this is something that keeps coming up. And this is this is this is interesting. This is why this is why I like that that stat from Databricks because most people look at uh, customer wins in the sense of oh we just won that from Snowflake if you're Databricks or Snowflake from Databricks or another company. But you don't have to migrate the entire workload over. This is where the numbers matter. So this is what Ali was talking about with me and and the team uh, in the, in the uh, analyst sessions. They can get chunks of the workload and significant money in the if they're big customers because they're spending a lot per year. So the growth rates reflect that. And then again, Databricks is catching up to Snowflake. That's another reason why. And I say that they'll probably be mad for me saying that no, we're never catching up. We're, we're always ahead. No, but they are catching up. Snowflake ran the table right out of the gate, and they have a lot of big customers. So so yeah, it makes sense. But again, the Databricks numbers are impressive. I um, think that the two point the two point four billion number is legit. I think, John, where there's some confusion, as I have said many times, that, that you know, it, it's you got to make an apples to apples comparison. I've even probably said things like it's not necessarily an apples to apples comparison, but I think that's it could be misinterpreted. So I have to really be careful about how, how I choose my words. I have no doubt that customers are and 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 Snowflake and Databricks when they do their TCO models, or they're not gaming the system. I mean, even Oracle now. I think does a fair job of including all the costs and have done a lot of TCO work in, in a variety of places. So you have to include that. I think there was some misconception that we were saying that maybe that Databricks is not including those costs. Of, of course they are. We understand that. And, and so we just haven't done the independent work ourselves. Um, and it's it's time we did. We've been talking about this part. We will. Long. We will. All right, well, let's get on that. Well, the other thing about Databricks and Snowflake was the whole open source thing. I thought that was very interesting. Um, Polaris, 90 days, it's going to be available and only for metadata, apparently. Uh, Databricks um, <laughs> but hit the publish button on GitHub right there and said it's now available now. So they open source Unity Catalog, which is huge. So and, let's and, talk and, about and, this. Explain it. Well, the um, Snowflake announced Polaris. You were there. Um, and, yeah, and let me... 
Go, you explain that. Yeah. Let me pick up on that. So Polaris is essentially a metadata catalog, the technical metadata catalog only, only the technical metadata. And, And Databricks or Snowflake open source Polaris, they made a big deal about that on Monday. Horizon is actually where you get role-based access control and all the like heavy governance, but that's, you got to be, that that's Snowflake proprietary. Um, and so the big question we asked is, okay, well, how far is, is Snowflake going to go with, with open source? Are they eventually going to bring Horizon-like capabilities to open source? If they do, then where's their moat? That was the big question that we were asking. What I saw on stage was Matei basically saying, we're going to open source Unity, basically trying to make a kill shot to Polaris. Now, the question is, how robust is Unity and and does it have all the capabilities? And and if it does... Pretty damn good from what what we're seeing. And and, and he pushed it to GitHub on stage. Right. It It was an F you to Snowflake big time because they yes. had put before he had to press the send button or probably <laughs> commit button. It said 90 days available. So he's like, now it's available. And then everyone's cheering. So, so, so let me let, it's let, playing let, to let, the crowd for sure. But it's definitely, you can see Snowflake. Uh, I mean, Databricks saying, you know, hey, we're pushing stuff now. So let me add some color if I can, based on my understanding. You got Polaris, which is the technical metadata, and you got Horizon, which is all the, the really good governance stuff that's, that's not open source. Mm-hmm. And what Databricks has done is say, we're going to take the equivalent of both of those with Unity. Oh, and by the way, we just bought Tabular, Ryan Blue's company. Mm-hmm. So we're going all, he's the creator of Iceberg, one of the creators when he was yep. at Netflix. So now we're all in on Iceberg. We're all in an open table formats. And we're going to bring that capability to open source. And that is a big FU to Snowflake. And the reason why this is so important, let me explain, this is so nuanced, is Snowflake popularized the separation of compute from storage so that you could run it in the cloud, infinite compute, infinite storage. You didn't have to buy it in chunks, in clusters. You could separate them and scale it up, scale it down and turn it off when you didn't need it. What Databricks is doing is they're enabling any compute engine to work on any data. And that's what Iceberg and other open table formats do. So in other words, whether you're Trino or Snowflake or Starburst or Databricks or AWS, whatever, as long as you're embracing open table formats, you can bring any compute engine to any data. So we're separating compute from data, not just compute from storage. What does that mean? That means if your moat was the fact that you had everything inside a snowflake governed and managed, and you can now do that in an open table format, that shifts the moat toward governance and then maybe applications, Gen AI capabilities, product features, et cetera. But things are clearly yeah. and yeah, and and just I'll add one thing to that. What it also means is um Databricks is essentially saying we want to force the market to go open so that there's more data collections out there where data sources and you can connect to them. And then the compute is any compute may the best engine win. That's what they're saying on stage, but it also um, enables a new dynamic power dynamic in the marketplace with developers and enterprises where it enables the data engineering, Dave, to go the next level. And here's why. If you're stuck with this fragmented data estate market, which is, is siloed data warehouses are siloed and snowflake, started the movement and then Databricks quickly followed with the lake house there to change the game on this. And this is why they're successful. But the next level capability is a company-wide redo of their data engineering and data estates. means companies are actually looking at doing a complete reset, a complete overhaul, a rebuild of their entire data architecture and platforms, management strategies, products, everything that requires serious data engineering. So what happened with this week with Databricks that I was kind of connecting the dots on was the uniform general availability was out from Delta Lake. That's a huge kind of like low level unified data storage, um, which is like locks in like for sharing, um, reliability, seamless access uh, with governance, huge. Unity catalog is more of the 
access control, the lineage, the auditing, monitoring. They got metrics in there now. So they're going to enable more of those Gen AI features in with that Unity catalog. And then and then that sets the table for the Mosaic AI suite, I call it. It's not really a suite, but it's a framework. Uh, it's, it's a tool layer. It's a tool just toolbox. It's a collection of tools for monitoring, training, evaluation, deployment, governance. It's, that's the that's where the picks and shovels are. Okay, that's where you train your models. That's where the action needs to go to. And if you don't fix the, the the Unity catalog governance with the with the uniform format, it doesn't get scaling that way. Yeah, it can always be Databricks specific. Then Lakeflow, small little announcement is the engineering tools that Databricks announced for orchestration, transformation, ingestion, et cetera. That's the data pipelining, Dave. Okay, and of course, now serverless, 100% serverless, eliminates what I call the Hadoop problem, managing clusters, turning knobs, um, cost, uh, un underutilized resources. So that's killer on the compute side. But this lake flow, what's going to happen is and if you have open, if you separate data from compute, you can connect data sources. And this is where the data pipeline is going to be critical. So I thought lake flow was pretty interesting. And I think that might be a signal that Databricks is going to build stuff in there, which could take out other companies. Like, like there's companies out there that do this as a company. So unlike AWS, where they have competition with their ecosystem, Databricks has to be careful that they don't turn into Microsoft like Windows, where you, if they do a feature, it just kills companies category, categorically, right? So, so you're going to start to see the, the decision between the Snowflakes and the Databricks, what they build into the platform and what they enable someone else to do. It's not as easy to say, oh, we have that and you can compete co-opetition co with us like AWS does because the platform requires it. It's kind of like Windows, right? Remember the old days in Windows? If you built like a utility and then they come out with one, you're out of business. Right. So this is a huge dynamic. So more data is going to be coming on board. So if you can't connect to it, that's that's to me is where um, this goes. And I think that's going to open up um, in the next two years, a data engineering tsunami of reset, retrofitting, replatforming, and large-scale enterprises. And they'll, I think they'll probably have Snowflake and Databricks. And that's why the open format thing is interesting that Iceberg might is coming on board because to me, buying um, that company, okay, means Ollie's saying, You're, we're going to do it. We're burning the boats. We should spend $2 billion to burn the boats because I don't think Iceberg would have connected Dave with Delta Tay, Delta Delta Lake. So I, I just don't I just don't think that would ever happen. The formats are different. Everyone I talked to is like, ah, they were kind of close, but not really ever going to work. Ryan Blue, I think, told us. I think he told us, and it was either a breaking analysis or another conversation. He goes, that'll never happen. And then now, now it's going to happen. <laughs> it's going to be forced. But I want to go back to something you said about maybe the best engine win. That's an, an interesting comment because. You know, Snowflake has a really good engine. You know, it's it it that's what it's it's been its claim to fame. The interesting thing again, I come back to the ETR data is when you look at the database category, which let's face it, I mean, Snowflake had a five year lead on on Databricks and database, but it's amazing to me to see how many customers are actually adopting adopting Databricks. In that sort of database category, I know it's their whole lake house architecture, but but and and it's really interesting to see the momentum that they have when you measure it in spending velocity. It, it, they don't have as much of a presence, obviously, as Snowflake has, but they they do better than I thought. Just like Snowflake is doing better than I thought in in AI based on the 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 uh, survey data. But but basically, the lake house architecture, which is the schema, the 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 Delta Lake, the acid transactions, the whole Unity catalog, that's coming together. And you still got to go through the Spark execution engine. Uh, but to your point, may the best, not even just the best engine win, is it just going to, it's going to come down to architecture and open formats. And the last thing I'll say is I talked to a lot of customers at Snowflake Summit that said, we are all in on Iceberg. And when I said to them, how are you going to govern that? And their answer was to be determined. That's well, like the, when, when, when Ollie says may the best engine win, what he means is the best engine that has completely decoupled compute from data, which means Snowflake's engine compute tied to their data is not even a factor in that equation. It moves the goalposts. That's what he wants. He's saying that's his end game. He wants to force Snowflake to unbundle 
to compute there. So if he does that, then the snowflake has moves there, moves changes. So again, well, it's, a, it's a chess game. It's a chess match for sure. But that's why I say it's going to come down to the quality of quality of what you can get in open source. And I think you know what Snowflake's doing is they're they're saying they're embracing open source. They have no choice. They've admitted that. They said that customers are forcing us to. And I think they're saying, all right, go go for it. See how that open source experience works. And 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 you know, let us know if it's not working in the way that you want, and it's not you're not getting the governance. Come on back into the Snowflake pond. And if it is working and there's 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 they're hedging their bets, then they're going to have to open up in new ways and define, you know, new modes based on different attributes. And that's that's what's, what's what makes this so interesting, John. So let's uh -huh. talk about let's talk about generative AI now. Let's shift the gears to the market. So it's good 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 riff there on Snowflake and Databricks. Um, should be a headline of this podcast, obviously. Um, but we're all talking about this next wave generative AI, and it's coming. David Linthicum on his AI Insights, which is a new podcast he's doing with the Cube, um, really kind of drilled down on this. So two things to talk about here, Dave, is budgets for generative AI. Um, some are reporting. We've been seeing it. I've been seeing this in the marketplace and people I talk to, bifurcation of budgets, either non-Gen AI and Gen AI projects are going to get funded. Um, Gen AI is getting more funding, so it's got to show how it's going to contribute to that. But what David's saying is, is that there's not a lot of stuff blooming right now on the ROI side. And so, you know, there's value there. And he pointed some reports. I saw some threads this morning, but, you know, he talks about this on the pod, his pod. Um, the enterprises are rethinking this in his mind. Um, use cases. Well, what's your thoughts on on budget allocation? Do you see bifurcation? And two, where's the meat on the bone when <laughs> on generative AI? I mean, everyone's buying up all the all the, all the chips. Broadcom's got a ten to one stock split. Um, Nvidia's stock is skyrocketing. Um, yesterday, yeah. I think Broadcom was up a hundred points. I know. So good, strong earnings. We'll talk about that. So. We've been reporting on this, John, for probably two or three cycles now through breaking analysis and ETR data that 40 plus percent of the Gen AI customers that we talked to, 40 percent of those customers, 42 percent to be precise, said that they're stealing from other budgets to fund Gen AI. So right off the bat, you're seeing you know, competition for budget, number one. Number two, as we've again reported, if you go back to January of 2023 and look at the sector spending, there's there's cloud, there's there's containers, there's RPAs in the mix, and ML and AI are there as well. If you go now, it's ML and AI way, way outpacing the momentum of all the other sectors which have been pushed down. The third data point I'll give you is ETR, we do these drill downs with ETR every every quarter, and they're asking, what is your organization's evaluation of Gen AI for business cases? Why has it not resulted in usage and production? One of the barriers for the first time, uh, lack of budget has popped up in over 20% of the customers. It's you know still an eval it's still data privacy, legal compliance, but then lack of budget is now the third most prominent reason. And then two other data points, we're seeing the ROIs get pushed out a little. More customers are, are pushing out from less than 12-month ROI to more than 12-month ROI. And the second thing is what shocked me is only 3% of the of a 1,000 customers that they surveyed, only 3% have RAG in production. And only about 4% plan to roll out RAG in the next four months. Four months. 21% are experimenting with RAG and 26% say no plans. And then 21% say they don't even know. They have no clue. So, but only 7% are either already in production or plan to roll it out. That seems like a really low number. I, I back channeled Mac Baker about this. He goes, he thought it was really low too. He thinks maybe we're talking to the wrong yeah. people. We should be talking to data scientists and Python programmers who are probably responsible for you know doing some of that work but i i, I found that surprising yeah you... I, I i do no i think it's low I mean, first of all well, no one knows what the hell they're talking about when it comes to which areas which because it's so different for example if you look at if you cut it by industry they're, they're completely different numbers right so financial services is higher i mean i see one report from the lucid works one financial services 70 percent b2b 68 percent we're going to be in, increasing their spends next 12 months 
Okay. And plans to increase. Okay. Real estate's the lowest at 42%. The average is about 63%. So this is on Gen AI. This is on Gen AI, generative AI spendings, plans by plans to spend and increase spending. B two B, obviously high financial services, high um, healthcare is not even in there. But but you know you're seeing conservative, you know plus fifty percent in most regulated industries. But for the most, and there's I can see that being conservative. The issue is the use cases. It's 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 the it's enterprises are different than the consumer. So like I, we said this before in the podcast, the consumer market, like a perplexity and these large LLM proprietary models, they're home run swings. They got to hit the home run. They got to hit swing for the fences. Enterprise is different. You got to get the acquisition of the data. You got to manage security and privacy. Your data stays fragmented. Your data in an LLM or small language models, proprietary intellectual property. There's no real best practice on how to integrate that into a, a, a large language model. And then you got access control, cost, how you track the business case. I mean, you start at enterprise is just a different animal. So I think there's going to be a longer um, sauteing of this market, you know, a little bit more um, until the use cases come out. But I think definitely people are doing stuff. RAG is out there heavily, uh, more than people think. Um, and most of the work's being done in the data engineering piece. And that's why governance is so hot right now. That's why we spent a lot of time with the Snowflakes Databricks and the, the war there. Because a lot of companies don't have a full data engineered environment. So they're doing things in pockets. So I think Matt Baker would probably agree to this too. And that's why I think the AI factory uh, positioning for Dell and HPEs of the world are working because people are starting to provision their own stuff. They're setting up the table for this. So I just think that it, it's it's a little bit hard market to quantify the numbers when you do surveys and track it. But for the most part, I think people are definitely seeing value. And I think they're taking a cautious approach with the, the data, with their data. Every, well, sing, every single conference is talking about this. Yeah, yeah, AI hype. But then when you when you get down to it, when the rubber meets the road, it's like, okay, we've got to do controlled experiments with data, making sure it's not going to leak out. Uh, it's all about security and privacy. And, and, uh, and that's not a lot of Wild West kind of fast and loose stuff going on I, in the I, enterprise. I do think some of his definition, too, is like, what do you mean by production? Like, would you consider the cube AI in production? Yeah, and that's brag. Is yeah. it in production? Yeah. Okay. Well, we're one of the three percent then. So, but I could see a lot of rag not being in production. I could see. I could see a lot. You know, experimentation going on. Um, I mean, but but, 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 but if you're an enterprise, why would you rush something in production unless you knew one hundred percent it was working? Right. To your point, and like, and like, like, this is why. Well, you look at HPE's quarter. H HP servers grew. Like eighteen percent last quarter, and they, unlike Dell, which grew forty two percent in servers, HPE actually showed more profit. Dell's profit was actually down, which freaked a lot of people out. But Supermicro growing like two hundred and fourteen percent. So you're seeing the point is to, to your point, this yeah. sovereign AI where people want to keep data inside of their boundaries, inside of their borders, is a big thing. All right. So here's here's on Silicon Angle. There's a great article called. Um, on the AI insights and innovative podcast, where the use cases to justify where where are the use cases to justify generative AI investment by Mark Albertson? He's covering the podcast that Linthicum just put out. Okay, but listen to this quote. This is from David Linthicum on our Cube Collective team, Cube team, Cube Research team. And this is a direct quote: There does there doesn't seem to be much ROI on leveraging generative AI systems as people thought, and that's causing a bit of a dilemma. Linthicum noted, CIOs are taking a look at where the current enterprise is, the use cases that are there, the ways in which generative AI can add value, and ways in which it's probably not a good fit. We're going through this iteration right now where we're adopting this technology. So what he's basically saying there is, it's like they have to figure out what, how to kill a deal, how to kill what, what not to approve. So there's all this evaluation going on, and, and the reason why Dell's doing well and these companies that are selling the hardware is. People are provisioning their environments now. They're, they're setting up their infrastructure to do these experiments. They're not full full enterprise wide data engineering. I think that's going to be much on the on the on the, out the big whale companies like the big banks, the big insurance companies. They have such a huge IT estate. There's an, an argument for them to completely re-engineer their data for generative AI. I think that's definitely in play. But what Dave is pointing out is that just the, the the nuts and bolts enterprise IT department CIO. They got to get their arms around this. And so hey, I, I believe his quote, I think there's no magic system yet. It's 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 being built. 
so I think well, there's some time c- to come down. Um, and you know, David's advice is to, is is pretty much the same as ours. He's saying just identify the use cases and get started. Right, just test it. Get some rag going in a controlled environment. Don't worry about the leakage. Understand how it works, and then just figure out where the use cases are for value. But that's so, a good article. People should check it I'll out. Give, I'll give you some data too. So <clears throat> the, the the percent of customers again, there's 1,300 customers in the survey. The percent that are not evaluating um, or have not evaluated Gen AI is down to 14%. That's up from, that's down from 52% a year ago. Okay. So it's down to 14%. There's still 14% that aren't evaluating it. When you talk to them, it's because it's too risky. Okay. And then when you ask them about use cases in production, it's very chatty, I call it. So it's text and data summarization. That's still growing. Writing content has actually peaked. Uh, external customer support has peaked. They're still the most, some of the most prominent. Code generation is looks like it's peaked at you know whatever 25, 27 percent of the customers. New workloads or new use cases, meeting summary, okay, nice, and enterprise search internal or external. Other is really really small. Other being so. My point here, John, is the reason I share this. Enterprises I've been saying are hitting singles with gen ai they're not hitting home runs the home runs are in that other category and that's like one to two percent of the customers that's a long-term payback period they're talking four or five years of development three to four years of development these are big things you mentioned that you don't see much stuff in healthcare and pharmaceutical you know it's there but it's these chatty applications it's those big cancer solving types of use cases that are going to take much much longer to to evolve well, I, I love the Gen of AI movement. I think it's definitely not hyped up. Um, uh, there's definitely a bubble, but I think it's going to be a little bit challenging for the enterprises to get the use cases. But there's definitely the, it's definitely going to change things over. No doubt in my mind. But, no doubt know, in my mind. You know what? You should you should people if you're interested in an, a counterpoint, you should listen to Jeremy Burton at Snowflake Summit. I sat down with Jeremy. He's a very thoughtful individual, and he's kind of a skeptic on this. So I would go listen to that and listen to his rationale. Um, yeah, what's, his, what's, his, what's his rationale? Observing, saying, yeah, it's just hard to get really big NVV on this stuff unless you're consumer internet. You know, consumer, it's like Charlie Kawas said, consumer internet, no brainer. Build no brainer. GPU clusters, make more money selling ads. And enterprise, not as clear. Enterprise is going to enterprise is, is going to is completely different. Jeremy knows Jeremy knows this too. He, but he, he's he's comparing the hype of say a perplexity at a billions of dollars of valuation, um, and open open AI and those folks. That's a consumer market. And then Meta and those guys, those guys are consumer infrastructure. So yeah, he's right on that. The enterprise, where I think if he would agree, would be Jeremy would say, hey, just like during the mini computer craze, remember the, when the, when the mini computer craze happened. Um, it was a big push to CRMs and ERP systems. The software business changed everything there. So that was a structural change. I'm not saying it's going to be as slow like that, but similar structural change will happen. And and my thesis is, is that the, the, the generative AI impact is going to be user experience based because the data will drive value and there'll be structural change, structural change around what apps look like, how they're deployed. In the case of CRM and ERP, the mini computer replaced the mainframe, right? Apps. And so I think the enterprise will just look different. It'll, it's not going to be a clean cut case of that's the, the model. The model is workflows and data and <laughs> workloads and data, workflows, workloads and data and the user experience behind that. And that's going to where the companies have to get creative. And that's why they're stalled right now. I said on the podcast for the past like five podcasts, everything's stuck in the enterprise because the infrastructure is not there yet. The data silos and the data estates are are holding back. So that's why the picks and shovels generation on the enterprise is happening right now. And that's what happened at Databricks. And the same thing happened at Snowflake Summit, I'd imagine. The same thing. And if you look at the funding, you know, the, all the funding's coming down for the AI startups that are doing kind of like in the weeds, weird enterprise stuff. Outside of that, it's all consumer startups. Yeah. Uh, and and if you and if you look at like uh, companies like Click, because we went to the Click event and Boomi, another company we went to a couple of weeks ago earlier. Those guys are adding agent technology to their workflows. So I think you're going to see a different market in the enterprise. Now, if you go to a company like Perplexity, 
Perplexity AI, which is a search engine. It's phenomenal, Dave. You can go to Perplexity right now and type in what, what happened at the Databricks Data AI event. It'll tell you, of course, we're source, our, our videos on the front page. So I'm excited by that, that query. And then if you say, ask a follow-on question, what does John Furrier think about the event? Just that string. It comes up and sources my commentary on the cube. It's incredible. So that is just, that's where neural networks are going to come in and to have and be handy. So in that- does it give you clips? Not, not yet. Only videos. They're not. They don't have. They have. They have not innovated like we've done with our AI system. But, but they're good. I mean, basically, it's if you go to go to go to perplexity right now and type that in. It's pretty incredible. No, I'm looking at it. So the key puts and takes from Databricks Data Plus AI Summit, Lakehouse IQ, Gen AI, Databricks Marketplace, and Data Engineering and Analytics, LLM Ops Tools, Negatives. Enterprise readiness of Gen AI, data fragmentation and governance, debt levels, although what, not... What, what, what was your query? I said, what are the... Uh, based, uh, let me see. I just said, what are the key puts and takes from the Databricks Data Plus AI Summit? Well, well, well type this in. What happened at Databricks Data AI Summit? Question mark. Summit, what happened? Okay. That's the query, uh, yes. Look at the John Furrier. No, did you, did you see the keynote analysis right there? I'm kidding. I'm teasing you. It's coming up. Here it is. Uh, major announcements. Is there a video on the right hand side? AI. Yeah, da some Databricks video. Oh, mine's got keynote analysis right there. It was Jensen, Jensen, it's got Jensen, Matei, and Ali. At the, at the bottom, it says ask a follow up question. What did John Furrier think about the event? Okay. It's in the same thread of the original query and it comes in. And oh, it's, wow. it pulls up all the videos. Um, it it's got all kinds of cool stuff. What to expect during the Databricks Data Plus AI Summit, Analyst Angle. Yeah, there it is. It's got you, Stretch A, George, Savannah. What's the, what's the answer? It says, Furrier highlighted database announcement of Gen AI platform Mosaic. Emphas he emphasized the acquisition of Tabular and Apache Iceberg table format. You know, and all the sources are there. It's like essentially link my LinkedIn. Strategic positioning, generative AI, focus on developers and coders, evolving with the market. Furrier described the summit as showcasing the next Databricks, indicating the company's evolution. <laughs> why do we need the cube pod? We just... <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> this is what this is why I like perplex. Yeah. This is this is what's going on. So what's happening is real-time news. Okay. Our ability to do the analysis in the moment. And that's why getting our videos up and us oh, so are up there is get quickly. And then the multiple diversity of sources, Twitter, LinkedIn, Databricks sites. So the engines are getting smart. The neural networks are tracking um, high quality original content. And now you can actually tie it to the event. Um, if I did Snowflake, I'd probably see what that, what happened? Yeah, I'm asking how yeah. it compared with Snowflake Summit this year. How did Databricks compare? Major events. Yeah, in case you missed it, you know, and then what happens is the slow, and now they have other articles from like Venture Beat and CRN. A little, little bit slower. There's no cube links there. I do think, I have to say, I mean, the, the Databricks keynotes were kind of long, but they were meaty. And I think they were somewhat more interesting to me. Although, I got to say, Snowflake Summit with Cortex, with Snow, Snow Park Container Services, they had... You know, the whole iceberg conversation, the partner stuff, the platforms, the application stuff, they had a lot to work with. Um, the keynotes, I thought, were better at Databricks. I thought they were more... Anyway, my, my point here is, is that Perplexity is doing this neural network thing where once you get that query in, I, the Snowflake, they must not have tracked some of our content there like Databricks did. Or then, or just maybe they was got replaced by other sources. But when I asked what did Dave Vellante think about the event in a follow-up question... Um, it comes up, and then there's more more on this. What were da uh, what did Dave Vellante what did Dave Vellante view the competitive landscape discussed with little prompts at the bottom? I can click on that. It's compelling. It's it's your insights. So it's like two. You're starting to get into for our video a too long don't read kind of vibe going here. It's like great. 
Thank you, Dave. Dave, you, I know you come. I watch most of the videos. So here, it just essentially summarizes you. The AI is working on your behalf to get your voice out there for the consumption. This is the value of AI, in my opinion. And and this this kind of experience is unique. It's never. So what does that mean for for us? You know, take take this. So if you if your competitive advantage is your data, okay, yeah. and all of our data is now in the wild and mm -hmm. perplexity can just take it and summarize it. Where's our moat? Our moats are our original content and the people who produce it, the talent. And ultimately it's like the uh, distribution and the, it's like the newspaper and the magazine has now been pushed to other people's platforms, the raw brain. It's like, it's like we're turning, we're like, in, we're, we're just brains right now. There's brains and, and, and voice. So, you know, as our, as you and others and do this, Whoever's got the best um, intelligence mapping to the query will be part of the result. So it proves, in this case, your commentary in real time was video at the event. We have a lot of cross-connecting other resources, um, Silicon Angle article, link, your LinkedIn breaking analysis, Cube Research. Um, you can ask it more deeper questions, but the, the point is once you start tracking in on these neural networks, it's, I'm already in this like view of snowflake and the question it's using neural network technology, not keyword clustering, like a Google search to track related conversations around what I'm interested in. In this case, what happened at the snowflake summit? So you're going to, this is the, the beautiful thing about neural networks and why, and why vector databases are so hot right now. Once you get into this thread, it's like tapping that side of your brain, the Snowflake Summit, and you're in that. And, and so what it means for us is, is to be programming and continue to serve the audience. And then the, the neural networks will form the best content around what the users are interested in. So I think right. that's where the algorithm is going to probably be, be refine tuning and reinforced learning. They'll learn that Dave Vellante has got a hot take, not just a hot take on Snowflake Summit, but he's actually got in-depth knowledge about it. He's a tier one you know, brain synapse. What this is going to do is going to kill the, the the pretenders out there who just take selfies at shows and have no hot takes, and then they just kind of go out there. They become dumb. And it's like they're high all the time. So <laughs> it's like it's like the brain won't work. Okay, I think it's going to um, compress the time to value to consumption. Right? It could yeah. affect audience. Right? I mean, yeah. No, it's going to impact. Well, it's going to impact. It's going to impact people's opinions. Right. And ultimately, neural network with reinforced learning will figure out that this is good, good related content and it's informed, it's valuable. So the, if you ask a, a generic query like, hey, what's in the news today? It might just do news summaries. But if you, when you start tapping into it and say, you know, what is the open, if you ask, what is Snowflake's open table, open data format approach? It might not have a better answer, as good of answer as our cube AI. So back to our power law. As perplexity is at the power law, the head of the long tail, or the big tail, the power law at the top, the specialty model, so the cube AI becomes an input into this. It can be connected to the neural network related to perplexity. So what I would do is go to perplexity and say, hey, guys, I want to do a deal with you and I'll, I'll use your API. So when my users come to our site, we'll blend in the neural network user experience we tap the best of safe perplexity and then bolt in our brain, which by the oh. way, if you go to the cube AI and type in what is Databricks's open data format approach, the answers are pretty damn good because now that's our transcript. Those are your specific words. I don't think um, perplexity has indexed every single video yet of the cube. Uh, and you, until, until it does, it probably won't have, you will have that. So do you think, but if it does, do you think perplexity is an enabler or a big disruptor to, to media companies. I think it's going to be a major disruptor. Okay. So, and then eventually it could become like an enabler the way Google search has, where people just are hooked to it and then have to tether themselves to perplexity, but maybe not because yeah, you don't well, have per, to, per, per, to perplexity is going to want, want to want to use external sources. See everything about these models are about cert, cert citations and, 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 um, um, getting data. So if you think about media company or anyone else, they're in the, data business. They go out, they, the old days was they'd collect stories, write them down, write them down on a piece of paper, type them into a computer, it gets published. And then the, the paper gets distributed. They're, they're collecting data and reporting it and distributing it. This is just an advanced version of the same concept. So all the media companies have to optimize for is data collection. 
And so we're still in the data business. It just looks differently. I mean, you go to uh, perplexity, you, you click on a paragraph and say, ask a follow-up question. It takes the specific context of that question and stays in that neural mode and we'll drill down on it. It's phenomenal. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a game changer. So, yeah. You know, Back to Jeremy Burton's comments, this is why the enterprise can't compete because their data estate cannot handle this. This is like mind blowing. I mean, you remember we did that story about Uber, people, places, and things. Mm -hmm. No enterprise is really set up to even do this. This is built from the ground up, just like OpenAI is. So this is why Jeremy's right on that front. But what the enterprises will do is leverage what they got and they'll start knocking down application workloads and add generative AI to that. So it's not like the earth had moved and there's a, a new new thing that happened it's it's adding gen ai into the enterprise so this is an example of, of d- drill down on this but again i'm super impressed with perplexity um they actually blow away open ai and some of these queries i did the same exact query with open ai and open ai did not meet the real time aspect that perplexity was doing so if you're out there perplexity anyone working in perplexity listening to this podcast you know we well, got a fan here and love to get more cube indexing going on there so there's a, just something that just came across my desk like minutes ago. Snowflake at a crossroads. Will Frank Slootman return as the CEO? This is from a Substack, from um, CyberSec, from Cyber's Substack. <laughs> In this report, we discussed Snowflake after engaging several top executives in the company. Could be a hit piece. Its competitors and key investors. Our main conclusions from these discussions are the company's fundamentals are considered weak potentially valuing it at half or less of its current market price due to slowing growth, low profit margins, and a vague strategy. I don't think it's strategy. That's a total hit piece. Frank Slipper was involved in making it like that. So he, yeah. he he tapped out at the top. Several customers looking to cut contracts by 20 to 30% by reducing usage or additional discounts to save on the snowflake tax. And so that's probably some truth to that. Look at Frank Slootman did his job. He scaled the company up. The and board, he hands the keys the over. Board is, who knows if this is true? It could be total bullshit. The board is pressing for Slootman's return. Slootman may be the only friend Sridhar has in this board. Oh, God. Sridhar may not be the right fit for leadership role. He seems to require guidance rather than providing it. I don't know if that's true. Having met the guy, he's, he's, he's run some pretty big businesses. Short sellers are eyeing the situation but remain cautious. Uh, fearing substantial losses if Slootman were to return, please. Come on, From that's, a, that is of, completely neat. That's bullshit. You think no, this is a hit piece? Absolutely. Why would they want Frank from Slootman's return? He already had the company optimized for o- selling the way they did. And if right. you want to critique Snowflake on anything, is they protected and grew their business too much, maybe took their eye off the product ball. But they can fix that with acquisitions. They have money. So I, I don't I don't think Slootman should be back because he's well he I mean he's a great executive they'd love to have him back but he kind of, he, you know what Frank does he scales the companies and he moves on to the next battle he did a data domain did it service now he did it at Snowflake he's a great exec CEO he's he builds it up scales it up and then passes the keys off in the case of service now they kept growing so Snowflake got to keep growing so I'm not sure Frank has that playbook in him what does he go from uh- here. Yeah, he's not a technical guy. He does not, you know, he's not a big R and D guy, and oh, and that's why I think yeah. they put Sridhar in charge, and because he is a technical guy. This thing, the Cortex strategy, is a complete head scratcher. Why is Sridhar purchasing GPUs from Jensen? That's puzzlingly not. He's buying them from Cloud, <laughs> and so and what they're doing with Cortex and and Nvidia is they're containerizing it, so they can. Their vision is actually pretty pretty cool. I mean, this is. Uh, Benoit Dajaville, which is to to be the place to build data apps. They want to be the iPhone of data apps, and that's that's not unclear. That's not a fuzz, fuzzy vision. Um, All right. Well, why, why isn't he just opting opting for a wrapper around Azure, which is common practice among? I don't understand that. AI will have winners and losers. We think Snowflake will come out as a loser. That's it. That's it. All right. Let's get let's 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 get down to the earnings before we wrap up. And by the way, um, it's Father's Day weekend, so Happy Father's Day to you and your, your you family. Too. You know, watch the U.S. Open. I always do it every Father's Day. Wish I was there, but uh, Zias is there. I think. I think I saw him on LinkedIn. He always gets to get those rounds. He's got the he life. Is. Zias he has is. got the life everywhere. Uh, yeah. um, uh, Broadcom, massive earnings, stock ten to one stock split. Um, yeah, they had a twelve cent Huge. rubric delivered. I mean, the rubrics just went IPO, so they probably sandbags. So they look like they're growing. 
Um, no, good no, job of them. They, they, but they, yeah, they they have to. They wouldn't go public if they were going to miss. Yeah, I mean, if you go public, you got to look. You got to know you're going to. It's like Bill Walsh at Sporty Nines used to script the first five plays of line from the line of scrimmage. You got to have those earnings gamed up. And delivering, you can't come out of the um, eight. 12, 12 cent beat on EPS. They beat revenue by, I want to say, a half a billion. Um, their revenue was up forty three percent, but that's because they were including VMware. If you take VMware out, they were still up twelve uh, percent, and they said ten for one stock split. Stock went crazy the other day, so that's pretty awesome. I mean, you look at the big four. Floyer and I just posted that. You know the big four, the four horsemen of Silicon, Nvidia, TSM, Broadcom. I got a lot. I got a lot of friends called me yesterday um, from VMware and Broadcom, chip side, just like gleeing. Oh, we'll come. So we did. Oh, Richard, oh, Broadcom. Look at the numbers. And the stock at that time was yesterday morning was like up up 180 points. Well, so you know. but you know, timely with the post that Floyer and I did a few weeks back basically projecting out the five-year growth rates. And it came out that those four companies were going to be half the market, this trillion-plus-dollar market. And, um, <clears throat> you know, pretty impressive. Then you see the the results. So They beat revenue by $12 billion, Dave. All right? You know? No, no. Competing no, estimates. No, no, no. No, the, the revenue was $12 billion. Their beat was about a half a billion, about five, 450, 460. Oh, no, no. The estimates was $12 billion. And they, yeah, they went by half a billion. By half a billion. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, our chips business is kicking ass. You know, Charlie Quaz and those and Hawk Ton, they know they're going to probably do another. They have so much cash, they could do it buy another company. You know, and Ben. Well, they're doing, I tell you, I, I, my breaking analysis this week, I looked at VMware Cloud on AWS and VMware Cloud. And you can see they're doing exactly what they said. So they, don't play well. None of the Broadcom stuff plays well in ETR because ETR is all about customer count. And Broadcom doesn't care about customer account. They care about customer profitability. So what they do is they narrow down and focus. They don't, you know, they don't care about new logos. The question, the question about Broadcom I was having yesterday was, will it double again? I think it will. I mean, I think Broadcom will probably go to about $140 a share because what, they're at $1,400 now. So 10 to 1 takes them down to a $140 a share. And with if the chip with the chip business the way it's going now, everyone doing custom silicon, they could double it again. So if you if you worked at VMware and part of this acquisition, this is why I got a lot of phone calls yesterday. You're sitting Broadcom, you got a lot of stock, and Broadcom likes to hand out stock to their employees. So if you stayed on with the Broadcom acquisition, you just got richer. So you can, and that had nothing to do with VMware either. Yeah, so, of, yeah. of, you know, a lot of people at Broadcom and they're just like, oh, they just threw me a bunch of more RSUs. I'm going to hang out for a while and cash those in and work my ass up. So, so John, we have Broadcom uh, basically going from a $36 billion company to a $60 billion, close to $60 billion. And I actually think that could be conservative. Um we got them growing at a 10% CAGR over the next five years. So, you know, <laughs> and we, I mean, NVIDIA, TSM, Broadcom, and Qualcomm. I mean, just, and then they're on the rise. ASML, obviously. Yeah. The ASML, they're the, they're the big ones. They control the whole table. Um, like, right. Well, Dave, um, looks like we're hitting time here. Looks like we pretty much dominated with the snowflake. How you feeling? We got another. We got the summer coming up. We just went through the, the big season. Um, got HPE next week. I just got an email. Looks like we're going to make. I'm, I got access to the used to be the AWS Public Sector Summit. It's now called the DC Summit, which is a it's a combination of both commercial and public sector, military tech, and also um, the New York Summit in July. So, um, well, hey, then let's get back into reinforce. I have never missed a reinforce. We didn't have a cube there this year. But by the way, just a shout out some of some of folks you know. G Rittenhouse is now with AWS. Really, Mark? Yeah, and he was he's he was great. Spent some time with him. Um, uh, Mark Terenzoni, remember him from Squirrel? Yep, he's still there and in and in digging it. Um, of course, I saw Merritt Bear. Yeah, we hung she's, out. She's not with she's Amazon awesome. anymore. She's with a new company. Yep, she was a startup and doing some really cool stuff as a female CISO. I love it. And then I hung out a lot with uh, Holger and Bob O'Donnell, a couple sharp analysts who aren't like deep security pros, as I'm not either. But we had 
we had a good time, but um, I'd like to get back in there as well. That'd be uh, we, the cube has done that show many, many times. Um, well, I think Amazon's like learning, like with the new management team, that the um, the events are just a different animal. And like the, what we, we've been on the show floor from day one at reInvent, but it's 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 the the show floor is just a whole different, more of a sponsorship model. Um, we're going to be aligning with the public relations and analyst relations team. They have space, and that's where the best talent comes in. And what what what's great is is that they now figured out that when you put the best guests on the cube the better the content, the better the reaction and say, Hey, content value. Finally. So, um, it's good to see AWS back in the saddle on, on, uh, that piece. Um, and it's, it's going to be fun. It should be real fun. DC. Oh, I, I'm really yeah. bullish on New York and DC right now because you yeah, see New York's the business of technology and technology driving business. DC is going to be at the confluence of all kinds of AI conversations, whether it's regulation and transparency to military tech, if you just look at what's going on with um, uh, with Israel, for instance, that drone strike, um, it's well documented that our participation in that drove a lot of success to protect Israel. But we we were using old school technology to do that, it cost billions of dollars. So, you know, if you have low cost drones attacking, you got to kind of fight fire with fire. So I think there's a lot of people talking about how technology can make us safer and prevent war and not just win them, but prevent them. So. Um, I think that's going to be a really big conversation, Dave, and and it's going to happen there in D.C. and maybe out here with Space Force. So, all good. Awesome, all right. Jim. Well, have a we great week. Talk about Apple. We didn't even talk about Apple. Oh. oh, Apple, the big news of the week. Do we have time? I will just. I got. I got to say this about Apple. I like their. Um, they call it Apple intelligence, not artificial intelligence. But what I liked about Apple was is that. Um, they're focusing on the device computation where the AI is going to work and that's going to solve the privacy problem. So the, um, the generative AI piece is going to be there. They're, they're apparently not training anything with personal data. So that's going to be a big part of that. But I like what they're doing. It proves the fact that on the computation on the device, the inference and the reinforced learning will happen there. And the chips will drive that. Again, back to your silicon conversation. So that's my hot take. And the rest of the stuff was camera updates, uh, a lot of good stuff there but the ai thing was what i was watching oh by the way the one thing about apple that jumped out at me was they used the word private cloud in their keynote i don't think anyone got the memo <laughs> you know? yeah, I mean, that's an old term private, like, cloud, cloud. private um, cloud i know I, I i wonder about the whole privacy thing if they're going to send us off to open ai uh, that's going to be interesting to see how that plays but i like the silicon angle that was a little bit confusing but still interesting yeah. um elon yeah. supposedly banning apple next right <laughs> because, because uh, uh, really apple apple got a lot of reviews brendan was just texting me math notes was that was a, a great demo um solves handwritten equations and that's where the you know, computer vision um and and all kinds of cool stuff will happen you know this is this is uh this is going to be changing again the whole world's changing education uh yeah i wish i had it in high school too brendan <laughs> yeah. I, I don't i mean i think i might have done better in high school if i had all this augmentation you know what's what's next day the chip implants um uh, we'll i see. think that's we'll coming. see we'll see all right well hey have, have a great weekend and uh happy father's day to everyone out there uh who has celebrating father's day and uh um, see you next time. Check out siliconangle.com. Tons of content from the events we just went to. HPE Discover next week. Um, more next weekend. We'll see you in the pod on next Friday. Bye, everybody. See you later.